Uh, again, uh, we thank all the visitors, those that are alive, that is, uh, and uh, watching our wonderful program that we've been having for quite some time. Technically, uh, we hope a lot of people are watching, but we, we've taped all of these for uh, programs in the future. We've taped these because uh, the historical uh, educational process, see, in the big future, it's like right now, if you can get old to extra certain tapes or certain recordings of Malcolm X and uh, one one uh, one CD or one tape uh, of Dr. King that I heard one Sunday when I was at the U.S. Penitentiary in Leavenworth and the radio station was a black radio station in Kansas City and it played Martin Luther King's lecture on Palestine. And it was one of the best lectures I ever heard on Palestine. But at the same time, when I got out, I couldn't find it. And nobody else has been able to find it. I mean, we didn't punch all the buttons. And uh, I'm going to try to look it up again. Um, can you punch in and see if you could find Martin Luther King's lecture on Palestine? For you already searched for it. I'll try again. Right. Yeah, Martin Luther King's lecture on Palestine. This is <laughs> Okay, technically, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, because we, you want to go on out and pass out some flyers. Uh, uh, we really, uh, what it seems like we're doing here is extraordinary. But when you read the Quran, What we're doing is normal for what a Muslim would do. You know, they are those who establish them there in the land, establish a lot, establish a system for the collection of distribution of zakat. They enjoy the right and they forbid the wrong and they believe in Allah. That's all normal. Then there's other ayats that deal with... Uh, uh, the NBA, the prophets, and many of the good people throughout history, what they went through is exactly what we're dealing with right here. So, technically, we had to develop a type of struggle that fits our environment but it goes along with the patterns of uh, religious history. And that, that's what we've done. What it reminds us of is that we, we are individual. It reminds us of two things, or more than two things. But if you ever seen a picture of uh, the African baboons, they have a big red behind and big old lips, you know. And they, when they walking around, walking and doing what they do, they behind sticks up in the air. And to us, it looks very, it looks uh, almost humorous. But to them, it's normal. It's absolute. What are you talking about? This is what baboons do. This is where uh, the same thing with telltale snitches and the other. They, to us, they look like baboons. I'm telling you, look. I already have read history, so I got a pretty good idea that nobody's came close to what we've been doing. Not only 
directly, but over any period of time. That's why we're so grateful and thankful. And when we always talked about longevity, you know what I mean, and protracted warfare, that's exactly what we've been doing. That is exactly, that's what we studied, that's what we understood, that's what we tested, and that's what we implemented. And evidently it was exactly what was needed. Because implement, implementation was evolutionary. At each stage of the struggle, we implemented uh, the challenge or the diversion or whichever stage we was going through. We implemented the, the strategy, uh, the tactic that would get us through that period. And many t cases, it was pretty much camouflaged. What I mean to say is this. The whole show, because of our activity, we got involved with the whole show. That includes, when we came here to D.C., we already had the game, what we call the game. We, we understood what we was dealing with. So we already had that. So when we came here, we knew what we was looking for. We understood exactly what we was looking for when we got here. No surprise at all. It was a surprise to the people because, number one, where we were going, like where we are now, nobody's got there. Nobody has even gotten close. For the movements in the past, I don't care whether you're talking about King, I don't care whether you're talking about Malcolm, I don't care whether you're talking about Booker T. Washington, and I would say one of our best brothers, Marcus Garvey, uh, he was a great, it was a great movement. But elementary stuff, like the psychological stuff. What we heard was that Marcus Garvey read an article in the newspaper in 1940 that said he had died, and he died. Maybe it was his time to go. I don't know. But he. that's the way we got it. Did anybody else hear anything about uh, that's Technically, what happened? But now Marcus Garvey, he, and especially at his time, he incorporated the biggest number of black people that was ever mobilized specifically to do a certain thing. And since he had never been where he was at, uh, until he got snared in little simple stuff like uh, putting a name on a boat and saying that. a federal case. It wasn't nothing. Okay. And sabotage. They would do everything to those boats that he bought. Now, you got to remember he sailed through the Caribbean, and he did some sailing in Africa. Now, the thing about Africa, the effect he had, like when you hear Kwame Nkrumah and all of them talk, they talk about who? Marcus Garvey. That man had an effect, and he used to have the Negro world, whatever it was, it was delivered up and down the coast in all of East Africa, I was in East Africa mostly, and in North Africa. Uh, they were Arabs, so they wouldn't have. Uh, but all the English-speaking people on both sides, on the Indian Ocean side of the Africa and on the West Coast side, West Africa, that newspaper, like black people in America, 
used to hang on there. They, they would wait for the Pullman porters. They delivered the Chicago Fender and other newspapers all throughout the South. They would get loads of them and they would take them with them throughout the South. And the people would be waiting on them. That's where they got the news of the world. They couldn't get it in the Mississippi Guardian, uh, right, a uh, rebel rouser. You know, they couldn't find nothing in there. And any Negro you saw in those newspapers, uh, so-and-so was caught in the chicken house stealing, you know, Mr. Sobe, so-and-so's chickens last week. That's what, you know, if it was in the newspaper. Uh, so many Negroes were sent to the chain gang last month. Of course, they didn't even put that type of stuff. But now, so in our time, first of all, we had to study our people and, and see what was workable. Because, see, a lot of people think that we just haphazardly threw stuff up in the air and it came down just like this is what we're doing. It didn't happen like that. It came from research, study, analysis, implementation, strategic thinking, all of those things. We did all of those things. The, what, what's happening here is the result of all of those things. And we come up with certain, certain um, steps of implementation. And one of us reminds us of when, uh, when you're out on the open highway at night and a deer or an animal get caught in your headlights, you could see their eyes bright as, you know, they're really bright. And the, the lights hypnotize them. Half the time, you, have to, you almost have a wreck yourself trying not to kill them. Because there they are, and they're paralyzed by that light, you know. And so, that's one of the things that we did with Boss Man here. Not only with Boss Man, but the Negro community and all of their helpers. Okay, look at the Muslim world right now. All the things that's going on, and you go anywhere to any masjid, you don't hear nothing about uh, what we should be doing here. If we harness Islam here, us, I'm talking about mostly African Americans, because the immigrant don't feel comfortable messing with uh, the American power structure. They don't feel comfortable. In fact, they didn't come here for it. Luckily, they came here and they felt a little lonely and they put a few Muslims together. You know, uh, Back in 63, when they started the Muslim Student Association, uh, that was big. Ahmed Sakhar and them started it. When they started the MSA, they started having, you know, a little membership, a few little meetings. When I used to travel around the country, the late 70s and the early 80s, the way you would find out where the, uh, the Muslims are, you would look in the phone book and see if you had a, see the Muslim names. Then you would call them and ask them, where is the masjid? Where is this, the Islamic center in this town? Some people would laugh. Some people would laugh. I did the same thing in Mexico City back in the 70s. I, you know, I was down there. Technically, I was on a vacation. Salato Juma came. I took my family down there. So I, said, uh, I called a few uh, pe people, you know, looking the same like he had a phone book. And uh, I talked to one guy. He was Egyptian. He laughed. Salato Juma? But you go down there now, they rolling. There's a whole 
crew of Mexicans that have come to Islam during that period. There's Muslims in Colombia. Some of the crews up here are really close to them, and I feel sorry for the Muslims in Colombia. Uh, their Shia community, and I know the Shia community here. Of course, there's some Sunnis, but I was in Colombia doing a whole different thing. The world was different. The world have turned over. The point I'm making is that what happened to us is like we have trapped the system in the headlights of history. They're paralyzed, like right now. They're paralyzed. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. And they keep, they, they have been trapped to the point 